An Introduction to Freud's Theory of Personality, Part 4 of 7, Anxiety and Defense Mechanisms. Dr. Mike Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. In this unit, we'll talk about anxiety in several different forms, and then how to cope with anxiety from a Freudian perspective through the use of defense mechanisms. Now, I actually think that there's some scientific veracity to this idea, as many serious researchers have studied the problems of anxiety and how to cope with it. In fact, a Freudian definition of repression has actually been used by modern theoretical psychologists to talk about some problems in the emotional life of modern people. Researchers, for example, have found that individuals who are psychological repressors tend to be more prone to having their anxiety convert to physical diseases, uh, gastric disorders, cardiovascular diseases, and things like that. I'll also make the case that in everyday life, using these defense mechanisms isn't a bad thing. It's only when they're overused that they can potentially become a clinical problem. I'll talk about how, for example, we might regress to an earlier stage of development, and you might find, for example, oh, a 62-year-old psychologist who has a lot of toys around his office. These are some things I bought for a demonstration. So I have my new little squishy brain. And as you can see, the eyes pop out to demonstrate Helmholtz work in nerve conduction in my history class. I bought this little froggy with the pop out eyes. And uh, all for the sake of adding a little fun and lowering the stress and boredom of anxiety due to class. I even have my new child uh, from the Mandalorian Disney series, uh, being not necessarily a Star Wars freak, but a Yoda-holic, and I find collecting these things fun and interesting. Now, they don't take over my life, and I really don't spend a whole lot of money. I'm not going to spend hundreds of dollars on uh, the Lego Yoda, for example, but some people do. Uh, my brother-in-law has an employee that is a Star Wars freak and has a massive collection of Star Wars items that are worth a substantial amount of money. When he ran into financial problems, he let his house go into foreclosure without selling the Star Wars toys. For me, that's pathological. So let's take a look at anxiety and how we cope with it from a Freudian perspective. Anxiety is an unpleasant state that signals things aren't right and something has to be done to correct the problem. We all experience anxiety in many different ways over the course of our lives. And we're going to talk about anxiety from a Freudian perspective. Freud believed that there were several different types of anxiety. So let's take a look at these. The first is objective anxiety. This occurs when there's a real threat to you. Uh, in this case, the kid should have been watching out for cars and the driver should have been watching out for kids. Uh, on our campus, uh, I see lots of people just cavalierly walking across streets without paying attention uh, while they're working on other things, talking to people, usually on their cell phones. The last year that I was chair of the Academic Senate, I got a report from our police department that there were 16 vehicular uh, pedestrian accidents on campus, and in each case, both individuals were on their cell phones. So obviously, neither was anxious enough about what they were doing. 
Neurotic anxiety occurs when there's ego and id conflict. Basically, the conflict between what the id wants and what the ego can do. Oftentimes, this results in behavior, as demonstrated here, with obsessive-compulsive behavior that reduces anxiety, things like obsessive hand-washing. Now, obsessive hand-washing, obsessive cleaning is an interesting thing because it usually is counterproductive. If you wash your hands so much till they're red, you're going to open all of your pores up to bacteria and most likely get an infection. So, watch out for that neurotic anxiety. Moral anxiety is caused between ego conflict and superego conflict. In other words, following the rules. So, you have moral anxiety, for example, when an individual breaks the rules and they may suffer from guilt for doing so. Uh, many, many examples of this exist. The classic one is the moral conundrum, do you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving child? Stealing is wrong, but also not feeding your children is wrong. So, what's a person to do? When I was in the third grade, I'll tell a story about myself here. Um, I saw this bright, shiny paper clip that I really lusted after that the girl in front of me had. And she had a bunch of them, dropped one on the floor. I picked it up under the kids' finders, keepers, losers, weepers rule. And I'm still feeling anxiety about that to this day uh, because I broke the rules. If I could find that girl who's an old woman now, well, she probably wouldn't like me saying that, I would love to give her a truckload of paper clips to assuage my guilt. There's also traumatic anxiety. Traumatic anxiety can be caused by physical or psychological distress. Uh, if you are ever in a car accident, you might not want to immediately get into a car and get behind the wheel again and drive. Uh, when my oldest son had been driving for about a year, year and a half, uh, he got into a car accident that was not his fault. Uh, his car was T-boned by a 15-year-old girl who was out driving on her learner's permit with some of her friends, which at least in our state, California, is illegal. Uh, I immediately gave my son the keys to my car when we were driving around and said, you got to get back behind the wheel and start driving again. But he was extra anxious and extra cautious in terms of his driving because, well, the accident. So, traumatic anxiety can be also psychological. You go through a psychological trauma, like a breakup or a divorce. I remember when I went through my divorce, feeling massive amounts of anxiety after being married to my first wife for almost 15 years. So, traumatic anxiety can be a pretty big deal. I'll give you one last example, because I like giving examples of anxiety. Vicki, my wife, uh, is very physical person. She's very active. Uh, one of the things I like to do is ride bikes. So, I bought her a bike, and we got mountain bikes, and then we graduated her to a uh, racing bike. And it was very touchy, it was very finicky, and it had those clip-on pedals that are kind of like ski bindings. When we bought her the bike, the our friend at the bike store told us, you're going to fall. I fell when I was learning to use clip-on pedals, so I warned my wife. But she's had a little bit of a stubborn streak, so... I'm gearing up to go out and take her for her first bike ride. 
I'm in the garage getting my bike. I've got her waiting in the driveway, and she decided she was going to take off on me. And I hear this big crash and a string of expletives. And I start going back out there, and then I hear another big crash and another uh, string of expletives. Turns out that Vicky had flipped herself off the bike twice before I got a chance to help her and show her the ropes of doing that. And she was pretty bruised up. But to her credit, uh, despite the fact she wanted to immediately take the bike back to the store after that happened, once cooler heads prevailed, she had to be a pro with the bike and can easily clip in and out of the pedals now. So she overcame that traumatic anxiety. We deal with anxiety through the use of what Freud calls defense mechanisms. And these are basically ways of coping or reducing, excuse me, the anxiety we experience in life. Let me talk to you about several different forms of anxiety. Uh, first of all, we have repression. Now, we haven't talked in this series of videos yet about Freud's tripartite model of consciousness. But I'm sure that you've heard about that in other classes. It's the easy stuff people teach you about Freud. So let's just look at this quickly before we start. There are three parts to Freud's consciousness, the conscious mind, which you're experiencing right now, the preconscious, things that you can recall, and the vast largest part of the psyche, the unconscious. And these are things we can't access. We'll talk about this in detail in a couple of more units. But let's get back to repression. So you have a thought or an idea in the conscious mind, but it's causing you anxiety. So you take that idea and you push it out of consciousness so you don't have to deal with it. But psychic energy is never created or destroyed. It has to go someplace. So you push that idea, that thought and the emotions associated with it in the unconscious mind so that you don't have to immediately deal with it. The psychic energy is still there. It's just not dealt with. Now, this happens all the time, and we probably repress lots and lots of stuff over the course of a day, things that are causing us anxiety, whether it's paying a bill, finding a parking spot, getting to class on time, uh, or anything like that. If it's causing anxiety, we just kind of push it out of mind so we don't have to think about it. I like to use the good old Tony Soprano expression for it. You just forget about it. Problem is the energy is there. And it remains in the unconscious. Now, the, another issue comes about if you keep repressing similar ideas. Eventually, they form a large mass in the unconscious mind. So, let me show you an example of that. Uh, or let's start with an example. Let me give you an example of things I constantly repress. I love my wife dearly, but she has the habit of not closing things. And we've talked about it and usually laughed about it. But most often I get caught up with her not closing stuff when she's not around. And in terms of relationship things, and this is personal, not psychological, I'm a not sweat the, you know, not sweat the big stuff kind of guy. I, little stuff, excuse me. I don't like fussing about little things. So, um, I'll be at home and I'll pick up a jar of peanut butter and the lid won't go on and, or the lid wasn't screwed on. And 
it might fall. So I'd get angry about that. So I take that thought, push it into my con unconscious. But then, because this is a consistent problem in our house, I might come around to another thing. Uh, so since we're talking about peanut butter, we may as well talk about jelly. One day I pulled a jar of jelly out of the refrigerator and the lid wasn't on and I should know by now not to grab things by the lid but the jelly fell made a big mess in the refrigerator made a big mess on me made a big mess on the floor but I'm still not gonna make a big deal about it so I pushed that into consciousness uh, another thing comes around and notice that the psychic energy in the unconscious mind gets bigger and bigger as all of these similar repressed ideas form a larger mass of psychic energy in the unconscious mind. So something else will come along, and I'll repress that. And then there might be one last thing, and I'll tell you about my favorite one to uh, use as an example of this. Uh, I picked up a bottle of Costco-sized ibuprofen without the lid on it. Bottle fell. I was playing 500 ibuprofen pickup. At this point, I repressed that too because, hey, life's too short to fight about little stuff like that. But the center of energy gets stronger and stronger, and it's still all in the unconscious mind. Now, if that mass of psychic energy gets large enough, it can pop back into consciousness, and you have to deal with it. It's kind of oh, similar to the last straw that breaks the camel's back kind of colloquialism. So, I'll be really angry because I'm picking up 500 ibuprofen from the floor, and I've had it. The energy has built up. And I'll pop out and I'll go on a rage and a rant. And I can tell you every time this happened, nobody else has been in the house. And I'll scream and yell for a little bit and do a couple of primal screams to get all of this tension out of my system. But it popped back in. So you can see how something like this works. If you keep on building up, building up things that you're repressing, eventually the energy is going to pop up and you might do something unpredictable uh, or not very nice like yelling and screaming. Uh, I've known cases where people have been picked on and bullied and they don't respond to each minor bullying incident but eventually what happens is they push so many of these thoughts down there that somebody comes along and says something minor and they blow. So repression is an interesting psychological defense mechanism. But the one thing that I really want you to remember about repression is that psychic energy never goes away. And just because we put it out of consciousness, uh, we still have to deal with it sometime if the energy gets big enough. Our second defense mechanism is a reaction formation. And you have an idea that's causing you anxiety. This time I'm going to give it a positive and negative valence. So you have an idea that you have that's uncomfortable. You push it into the unconscious. But it doesn't stay there. It pops up in turn as the opposite. So, let's say that you really, really like someone. I remember in my second round of dating, I broke up with somebody and they weren't ready to break up yet. And all they did was talk good about me. I broke up with her. And instead of uh, worshipping the ground I walked on, all she wanted to do was spit on the ground I walked on. There are some far more serious examples of reaction formations, though. Uh, this 
type of thing from a Freudian perspective may explain why abused people will in turn support their abuser, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You find this in spousal abuse, you find it in child abuse. Now, I'm not a clinical psychologist by any means, and these certainly aren't the only explanations for this type of phenomena. But I remember in an abnormal psychology class as an undergraduate, listening to an audio tape, which was how long ago it was, and listening to this abused woman who was talking about how she deserved to be hit by her husband because she did something wrong. And she loves her husband, and he's a good man, according to her. But she still received punishment and physical abuse. But since you're supposed to love your husband, she replaced the hatred she had for him with undying love. You find this phenomena also fits into this paradigm for abused children. I happen to have several friends who have suffered through uh, living with alcoholic parents. And it's not uncommon for a child of an alcoholic parent to be their loyalist and biggest supporter, even though the alcoholic parent may be abusing them or just neglecting them because of their alcoholism. Why? You're supposed to love your parents. You're supposed to love your mother if she's an alcoholic. And if she's doing nasty things to you, you might repress that anger and replace it with undying love. Some of Freud's psychosexual stages of development are related to defense mechanisms. And I'm leaving our discussion of psychosexual stages of development till the end of this set of lectures. But it's really hard to disentangle all of this stuff, and I'm sure you've heard about the stages of development before. So, a Freudian mechanism of fixation is essentially getting stuck in a psychological stage of development because it's too anxiety-provoking to progress to the next stage. Now, I have an amusing picture here of an adult uh, dressed as a baby, uh, not wanting to grow up, but you see this all the time. You see it sometimes in children who don't want to go to school. Uh, you see it sometimes, and usually it's associated with the stage of development, but it can be also associated with a life task. So you might have someone who's fixated on staying in college and not wanting to graduate. Uh, I was chair of our academic senate during the uh, last set of budget cuts. Hard to keep count on how many budget cuts we've had around here. Uh, but this was the budget cuts of the late 20 teens. And the administration was trying to graduate students and move them on. If you're a student on the Fresno State campus, you know that there's a big push to get people out and graduated. And one of the big indexes at many universities now uh, that they use as a marker of success is graduation rate. Uh, how many students can they graduate uh, in 120 units uh, as quickly as possible. As an educator, I have a lot of problems with that, uh, but that's a whole nother lecture that doesn't apply here. I think of it kind of uh, punching out widgets rather than uh, helping to train and teach people, but we're not going to solve that one either, so I'm going to repress that for now. When the administration approached me and said, we're going to graduate these students. And there were about a couple dozen extreme cases of students who had been around campus just far too long. 
there were many who had accumulated a lot of units. Uh, and there were some that were doing it for justified reasons, like having double majors. But the Grand Champion, Super Senior as they were called, had 260-some units. Why? They didn't want to graduate. It's too stressful to graduate. You have to go out in the real world. You have to start doing real world kind of stuff. Uh, I became a professor, so I didn't have to deal with real world kind of stuff. I can stay in school as long as I want to. But if you're a student, eventually you have to graduate. So this student had 265 units, and they had planned to continue on going to classes. They constantly changed majors. They missed deadlines. Uh, they did everything they could do to sabotage their graduation. So an administrator was tasked with looking at the super seniors and their transcripts. And so I was shown a letter sent to the student that says, Congratulations, you now are a graduate of California State University, Fresno. And you will be graduating this semester, whether you like it or not, basically. That wasn't in there. But what they did was they put together a major and requirements with all the different units the student had amassed and simply graduated them to get out of the university so that that person wouldn't be taking up slots and classes for students who are progressing with their degrees. When I was a first year or actually second year student in graduate school, I was teaching intro psych and met a person who had spent 13 years working on their doctorate. They got very comfortable working as a graduate student and they kept on writing and rewriting and rewriting their thesis. Kind of reminded me of Penelope in the Odyssey, constantly reweaving the cloth. So this guy hung around 15 years. Eventually a new administration came in and wanted to clean up things, so they pushed him to graduate. And he had a relatively comfortable life. It's not one that I would like to have for the rest of my life. But he was teaching a couple of intro psych classes. He was uh, living in a boarding house and in a large university town like Ann Arbor. There's a lot of free stuff to do. So it was very comfortable to continue being a student and kind of stressful to graduate because academic jobs have been hard to get. So they graduated him eventually after 13 years as a student. His doctoral thesis was 1,300 pages, two volumes. And he ended up at a small Catholic university in the Midwest where he lives now in an apartment and teaches a few sections of intro psych every semester. So he really hasn't moved on. He's just kind of stayed at this point. Now regression happens when you move to an earlier stage of psychological development because there's too much anxiety with remaining in the current stage of development you're in. You go back to a earlier, more comfortable, less stressful time. Many, many different examples of regression. You can talk about regressing as a child who experiences having a new sibling, kind of starts acting like a baby because the baby's getting a lot of attention, and it's too hard to be a big kid. I'll make a case that and this is one thing I really want you to remember about these defense mechanisms, that all of them, to a certain degree, are adaptive. It's only when you use them to such a large degree that you can't live a normal productive lifestyle that they get to be pathological. So I'll make a case that when we get together with our friends on the weekend, and we get involved in games, we regress to an earlier state to blow off the steam of 
a hard week at work or school. Uh, here are some guys bouncing on some balls. Uh, a couple of women playing video games. Uh, I have no idea what these folks are doing, but it looks very kid-like. Looks like they're playing in a massive blow-up house. Uh, you might get dressed up uh, so it doesn't seem like you're doing childish things. You might go and buy some expensive equipment like this paintball team has. If they went out and just played army, uh, people would look at them, but they can say that they're doing a sport. Here's some adults playing soccer. Same kind of thing. Here is an adult woman who is fascinated with Barbie and has a massive Barbie collection. So she regresses back to her younger days when she played Barbie. Uh, one of my main hobbies, and not a picture of anyone I know, just one stolen from the web, uh, a bunch of older people out there riding their bikes. Of course, those of us who ride bikes when we're old call it cycling. And we buy really expensive bikes and really expensive bike gear and clothing to kind of justify having that as a hobby. It sounds kind of cool to say, I'm going to go out cycling rather than, I'm going to go ride my bike. Uh, here's a guy that's probably regressed a little bit too far as he's riding his kid's toy car. Here's another guy who seems to be having a lot of fun at the expense of these kids pulling him along. Kids look happy, don't they? Uh, here's one of the greatest uh, things about being a parent. If you are a parent and you play with your child's toys and your child at the same time, important variable there, you're seen as a good parent. Although it's fun to play with your kid's toys, as these two folks are doing. Uh, I remember when I got together with my ex-wife on the first Christmas we had, my stepson was the uh, only grandchild around. He got massively spoiled. But what happened is everybody bought my stepson James stuff they wanted to play with. So one uncle got him a slot car set, another a toy train, and somebody, I'm not sure who that is, um, hmm, who could that be, uh, bought him a ton of Star Wars toys. Uh, if you think about movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin, if you buy a bunch of toys and you're an adult and you play with them, that's kind of weird, especially if you're missing important life tasks while you're doing it. If you buy a bunch of toys and you play with a kid, you're being a good adult, a good parent or uncle or aunt or something. Uh, sometimes the parents can take over. This is from a Saturday Night Live sketch on Star Wars toys. In fact, I've provided you links to two short videos that illustrate the point. They're not required viewing for class. However, they make my point about regression. And they're pretty darn funny. Our next defense mechanism is rationalization. Now rationalization is based on taking anxiety from an unacceptable situation and reducing it by providing an alternate explanation that's easier to accept than the truth. Uh, I found a little rationalization cartoon for you here on one of my perennial problems, dieting. Uh, the guy's talking to the woman and says the healthiest part of a donut is the whole. Which naturally is true because it has no calories. Unfortunately, you have to eat through the rest of the donut to get there. How many times have you personally rationalized something away, came up with an explanation uh, to fit what's going on and to uh, fit what you would want to believe rather than what's really happening. Uh, kids do this all the time, right? If you are a parent or you remember back to your days of a kid, 
You may remember using rationalization many times when your parents were upset with your behavior, and you might have heard the good old parental response, well, just because everybody else wants to jump off a bridge doesn't mean you should do that too. Okay, trying to get the slide to move, sorry. The psychoanalyst Karen Horney says that rationalization may be defined as self-deception by reasoning. You use logic to get rid of the anxiety. Then you have denial. Denial is not a river in Egypt. Uh, denial is when reality is anxiety-provoking and you simply deny something's happening. Uh, you deny the reality of a situation. Uh, so you don't see it as being really happening. You just deny things. Uh, the textbook uses an example of a woman whose husband had left her and she still sets a place for him at the table every night and refuses to deal with the fact that she's going through the trauma of a divorce. Sublimation involves channeling unacceptable energy, usually sexual or aggressive instincts, into socially desirable activities. So you may find the artist with repressed sexual desires uh, and he can't get the object of his affections, creating a great work of art. Uh, an architect may build a grand building to channel some of his or her unacceptable energy into something. Uh, Freud often talked about, for example, cities with massive skyscrapers as sublimations of sexual uh, energy by males into large phallic images. Uh, I found this picture of Dubai and the United Arab Emirates with these massive numbers of extremely interesting architecturally uh, skyscrapers providing a really good example of this phenomenon. So just to reiterate about our discussion of anxiety and defense mechanisms, we all experience anxiety in everyday life, and we all use defense mechanisms when we experience the anxieties and the slings and arrows of everyday life. What happens, though, is if you use a defense mechanism to such a large degree that you can't function in normal society, then it becomes a psychological issue. For example, neurotic hand washing may turn into a form of obsessive compulsive behavior. But a little bit of regressing on the weekend after a hard week, not a bad thing. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.